Welcome to the Covered Bridges of New Hampshire podcast, where we discuss all things related to covered bridges in the Granite State. Here's your host, Kim Chandler. Hello, Covered Bridge people, and welcome to the podcast. In this episode, we're talking again with engineer Sean James, this time about the 2014 21-month-long rehabilitation of the Bath Bridge in Bath, New Hampshire. Sean walks us through the process of carrying out a $2 million project on a 375-foot-long covered bridge and shares some interesting stories that he learned along the way. Here we go. In this episode, we will learn about the Bath Bridge that was built across the Ammanusik River in 1832. It's the longest covered bridge entirely within the state of New Hampshire. The bridge is located in Bath Village near the Brick Store, one of the country's oldest continuously operating general stores. Today we're talking with engineer Sean James, Senior Vice President of Hoyle Tanner & Associates in Manchester, who led an inspection team of the Bath Bridge in 2005. Sean has over 26 years of structural engineering experience, including over 40 covered bridge projects, including inspection, construction administration, and management of projects throughout New England and New York. Sean earned a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering and a Master of Science in Structural Engineering from the University of Maine and an MBA from Southern New Hampshire University. Welcome to the podcast, Sean. Great. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great. Thank you. So in, let's get started. So in 2005, the town of Bath hired HTA to inspect the Bath Bridge. Why was that? They were having some some issues with it. So New Hampshire DOT inspects all the bridges in, st in the state at least once every two years. Covered bridges, typically, they'll do every year, sometimes every six months. And they had picked up some things in their, um, their latest inspection that the town was concerned about, in, in particular, uh, the floor beams there had been shimmed quite a bit um, to keep the deck level, and a lot of those shims had come out. So the floor beams really weren't tr touching the trusses. Um, and there was one of the piers, the westernmost pier, had, had quite a bit of lean in it. Um, that lean dated back to like 1987. So the last rehab prior to what we did was 1987 with Arnold Grayton. And we, we found some pictures of that time and the, the pier was leaning, uh, but it, it, it was getting worse. And we, we could get into the history of the bridge in that particular pier, but the issue with it was it was founded on there's ledge. Then they built up timber crib work underwater and then this concrete and stone pier and the, the crib work underneath was rotting. And, the, and so the whole thing was kind of uh, was, was leaning quite a bit. So later on, as part of a separate project, we, we uh, encased the bottom of that pier in concrete to kind of prevent that and stabilize it. So the bridge was found to be, and the condition was rated poor to good. Um, is it, were there other things that went into that rating besides what you just explained? Yeah, I probably jumped ahead a little. That was part, that was a big part. There's also some rot in the trusses. Uh, some of the floor beams were broken. And, and that was, there was some some really heavy loads going through that bridge. Um, I don't know if listeners are familiar with like what a grader looks like. Um, you know, two big wheels in the back, a blade that grades the road and then wheels in the front. Well, in the past, graders had gone through that bridge, it, which is nowhere near uh, capable. Obviously it was capable of supporting but it caused some damage. Um, so those are the main the main things uh, that you know we mentioned, and and part of what we were tasked to do was look at what was wrong, come up with some cost estimates so that the town could you know get get funding together. Bath is a small town; mm -hmm. uh, I think about eighteen hundred people live there, so you know it takes a while to save some money. And but the covered bridges are really important to them. The base renovations that you recommended had thirty one suggested items at almost a two million dollar price tag is that is that typical for covered bridge work yeah it's a little uh, little misleading in that yeah we had we had that many if you say it was there i never counted them but if you say it's 31 i believe you uh, so new hampshire dot has what we use their standard pay items so and, and they're really specific they'll have one item for a certain type of concrete another item for different concrete uh we had probably 10 different items for timber repairs. So 
really when you get down to what we did, it's it's more like you know five to eight major work items, but it's just the way the uh, the contracts set up and they're paid for. You talked a little bit about heavy loads going back and forth over the bridge. So the base renovations would bring the live load up to six tons. Can you explain what that means? What the what live load means? Yeah, live load is basic. So the the different loads we talk about is is a dead load. So a dead load is the weight of the bridge itself, just mm -hmm. just sitting there. The live load is what goes over it, which is typically vehicular, uh, sometimes pedestrian. And then the other load we look at is a snow load. So in this case, six ton rating would be a, a vehicle with 12,000 pounds. And that comes up, why does 6,000, you know, why six tons versus any other number? Uh, it's basically a, a state law that if state funds are going to be used on a covered bridge, it basically has to be capable of carrying at least six tons. Okay. So, so that's where that six tons come in order to qualify for uh, the, the funding on this, they needed to, they can post it lower if they want, and some towns do, but uh, that six tons or 12,000 pounds is, is basically state law to get the funding. State law. Okay. And, and Bath chose to rehabilitate the bridge for a 10 ton live load and push the total work to 2.6 million. Why, why did they do that? Yeah, that was really for emergency services. So 10 ton, 20,000 pounds, uh, relatively speaking, it, it wasn't a lot of additional work or member replacement it was kind of more important, uh, to get to that higher live load capacity. And in the case with Bath, uh, their detour around that bridge is somewhere in the 12, 14 mile range. And the roads are not good on one side, you know, on the uh, on the west side. Mm -hmm. So that was a big part of it to get to that. It, it wasn't a lot of extra money. It wasn't a lot of extra work per se. Um, and it, it saved them, allowing them to get the uh, ambulances across. So what what other changes has the Bath Bridge seen over its its history? Yeah, quite a few. So it so this bridge goes back to 1832, and it's it's a really it's a unique truss. Um, it's kind of a modified burr or hop truss, which I just can't describe with words. But it's it's really neither of those. It's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's a truss that has built-in arches. So that's kind of the burr part of it, uh, and they're framed into the truss. Really intricate framery and you know framing in that bridge. It's a, you know, as far as changes or, or actually a little bit about it first, it's, it's 375 feet long. And then the roadway is 14 and a half feet wide, which is pretty wide for a covered bridge. There aren't a lot. Typically they're, you know, 12 feet, you know, for the, the lane. Mm -hmm. And then over the years on the, on the West side, the uh, White Mountain Railroad came through in like 1852 and put a, a line under the Western span. 1893, the bridge that was the, the dam that's there now was built for a mill, but now it, it's used for hydroelectricity. Mm -hmm. uh, John Storrs, who's a famous uh, Concord, New Hampshire engineer, looked at it and said, you know, we talked about the capacities. He, he put it at four tons. So, uh, well, no, actually, I got that wrong. Sorry. He, uh, he saw a four ton vehicle going over it and said it was only good for two tons. So he, he was really conservative. Uh, and then I mentioned the railroad going under it. And then 1917, and, and it was really interesting that that was the timing. And you think about the, you know, the First World War, mm -hmm. money's probably tight. Uh, the railroad paid the town to lift the entire bridge two feet higher, mm -hmm. um, which was, which was kind of neat. And then they strengthened it with the added arches. So I mentioned there's arches in the trusses. Mm -hmm. There's also some that have been added inboard inside them. Mm -hmm. And then it kept, kept changing the, uh, and we don't know exactly when they added timber bents on the West side over at the railroad. And then, uh, Arnold Grayton did his rehabilitation in the eighties. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it's, it's had quite a lot of changes over the years. One of the things I like, well, I like about that bridge. I can walk through it without feeling like I'm going to get hit by a car, <laughs> which, is, which is nice. This is not the same in every other bridge, but uh, yeah, it has that, that extra width and there's a little bit of a raised, we built like a little bit of a raised portion of the deck for people. Right. 
and you can see the arches and the the different styles of the arches, which is which is neat to look at. But you can also see when the and I hope I'm not jumping ahead, but when the wainscoting was taken off, you can see where the horses had chewed on the on the timber while they were tied up there, um, which which is a neat. I'm sure it's not structurally sound in any way, shape, or form, but it's definitely neat to see those pieces. Yeah, that yeah, that's cool. That's kind of in the southeast corner, southeast truss, and I think it was people coming from the west over to church. They put their horses and tie them up, and yeah, we worked really hard. We did. Uh, we did we did a couple of things there to keep keep those because they're they add a lot obviously a lot of character to the mm -hmm. to the bridge they do so can you tell me about how you you analyzed the the bath bridge and and made decisions on what you were going to do yeah that's that was a really interesting one as, as i mentioned it's a kind of an interesting trust it's had a lot of um changes to it one thing i left out that originally it was a three-span trust with two piers and then eventually they added a fourth pier and then later on they added these timber bends so it went from like a three span bridge to a seven span bridge and that really complicates things as some of those loads and different times are locked into it so what we we started with was a, a detailed inspection of the bridge uh, we had a, a contractor help us with that you know getting access measured the key members. Um, we also, one thing I think is kind of neat that people may not be aware is you can get a small test section. So there were certain members that were rotted. We knew would come out. We would take a little piece of those out and you can get them identified. Um, if you send them to like the university for service, um, they'll identify them. So we did that and found it was spruce in that bridge, which is, which is a local um, species. So, mm -hmm. So now we know the, the geometry of the bridge. We know the, the material generally that was in there and we create a computer model and some hand calculations as well. And we, one thing that was neat, we ran through a lot of different iterations with different floor systems. The floor there was not original at all. We knew for sure it had been replaced. And so we, we did some different um, setups basically to, to minimize the weight of the floor. And the reason for that was so we didn't have to replace as much of the truss, which was, mm -hmm. which was new. And uh, so a lot of analysis went into that. Joseph Beecher in our, our office uh, did the analysis on that. He's a super talented engineer and a lot of judgment goes into it, including, you know, I mentioned the loads earlier. One, one thing that's different with covered bridges is they have snow on them mm -hmm. you know, with the roof. So if you go into the, the codes we use for bridges, there's no snow loading in there. So over the years, uh, not just myself, other engineers and kind of coordinating have kind of come up with some different ways that we handle snow load in those. What is the design re review process for a project like this? So we we like to say that the uh, the design part that I just talked about is really the easy part. The uh, the review is, is the challenging part lately. There's this project had a lot of stakeholders, um, and it's ultimately for the better. We had the town, obviously, New Hampshire DOT with funding, Federal Highway Administration, uh, New Hampshire Division of Historic Resources, and National Society for the Preservation of Covered Bridges were all involved and reviewed. And so a lot of, a lot of back and forth there. Um, we have to follow the guidelines. There's NEPA is the shorthand, but... National Environmental Policy Act, because we had some federal funding in this one as well. And it really looked kind of at the environmental effects of your project. And then on the historic part, it's section 106, which is through the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. And so that makes us, the Fed, federal agencies, really look at how you know the actions are on the historic structures. And then because we're over a river, uh, we work with New Hampshire DES, Department of Environmental Services, to get wetland and or shoreland permits. Right. So a, a lot of these, a um, lot of meetings occurred, kind of, you know, a lot of good back and forth. And I think in the end, we ended up with a, a project, you know, everyone's, you know, I think was really happy with. Mm -hmm. it, it seems from, you know, for me, looking from the outside and looking back that 
there's a lot of times there's a pretty significant gap between when it's identified the bridge needs work and when the work actually starts. And is that because there are so many stakeholders and people that want to make sure that everything is up to, up to code? Yeah, that's a lot of it. It's, you know, for when the, the project's identified, um, like in this case, we, you know, going back to 2005, we did the study. So now you have a study and you kind of know what you need. Well, now you have to find the money. So then you find the money, you go through this process, uh, then you put it out to bid. The other part of that takes a bit of lead time is the construction. Um, a lot of the wood, a lot of the wood that we use on these projects is either Douglas fir or Southern pine. And those are larger members that take usually about, well, it depends now, but uh, somewhere in like eight to 10 weeks to get that, you know, those members in there. Okay. So there's, there's, it, it's it's for the better. Sometimes, honestly, it's frustrating going through some of this stuff. Um, but in the end, I think you you, you know you, you really come out with a better product. And I've also heard or seen that it seems like you know there's a a, a process and this is what we're going to do and this is what our plans are. But then once you start to open up the bridge, sometimes you'll find more things that need to be done. Did that happen with this bridge? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think my my favorite picture of this bridge, I have some really good ones with, we had all the siding off and you could, you could see the entire bridge and all the trusses and the built in and a lot that's hidden now. And the the thing I remember that was really interesting was typically if you're going to have rot in an arch, you expect it down at the bottom, the water hits the arch, goes down at the bottom and it rots down there. In this case, we had a lot of rot up high in the arches and I, I really don't know why there may have been a leak in the roof, hmm. um, something like that. But until the siding comes off, you, you just don't know. So what we, when we get to the construction phase, contractor takes the siding off. We do a real detailed inspection of what we couldn't see, mm-hmm. and then they, they then they place the wood order. We, you know, we make them wait till then to make sure we have enough. And even then, you know, the cords are usually four pieces you know, connected together. When you pull those apart, sometimes you'll find rot in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, really the, the, the killer on covered bridges is water. If you keep them dry, like, like this bath, 1832, keep it in good shape. It's, um, it's going to last a long time, but if it gets wet, it just does not last long. So this bridge, in addition to some other bridges, has a sign on it um, that says it's a $1 fine to drive any team faster than a walk on this bridge. What is that about? Yeah, that's that's interesting. I've, I've, I'd always seen those and thought, oh, that's kind of a quaint old sign or something. But in this case for Bath, uh, there's actually, let's see, I've got it down here, January 5th, 1833. There's a legislative act which actually sets the fine. And it's exactly what it says, you know, $1 fine to drive any team faster than a walk on the bridge. And I wasn't aware of it. It was, uh, well, the late David Powelson of New Hampshire DOT, he was a real lover of covered bridges as well. Uh, he uh, he made me aware of it and actually sent us the, the legislation. So uh, we made sure we had that sign on there. And, and technically, the town could, even today, put someone, they could have an agent and enforce that if they wanted. There's also a legend in town that when the military troops would march, they would break step before crossing the bridge as not to damage it. Right. That's wow. That's a, that's a really great story. Yeah. That you can, if you get at the right frequency, you can really, if, if you get the right frequency compared to the bridge, you know, think of like Tacoma Narrows, you know, the suspension bridge, it got caught in the wind and it just hit the right frequency and basically tore it apart. Uh, that, that can happen too. Obviously, this bridge is really long, and and it's four spans or seven spans, I guess, depending on how you look at it. For I know for you, it's a seven span. Um, but how 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 do you fix a bridge like that? How do you work on a bridge that's that's that long? Yeah, that's really where you need a a, a good contractor uh, to work on it. And what we've historically done is uh, pre qualified contractors. So we. We'll say that this project's coming out. Here's the type of work. If you're interested, send in your qualifications. And it's it's been about in in our area, New Hampshire, uh, somewhere between five to seven firms that will qualify, at least the way we we've done it. So you kind of narrow it down to that group that can because the last thing you want is someone learning on these types of projects and having a problem. Mm-hmm. 
here it was right construction and really challenging to shore this bridge. So in order to replace any of the bottom pieces of the bridge, you have to support it from the top. And what they did, which I thought was really neat, and it's been done a lot more lately, is they basically launched, so a steel truss bridge, and there's different, Acro is the, the brand name in this one. Mm -hmm. uh, people may have heard of Maybe Bridges, mm -hmm. uh, Maybe Acro, uh, but here it was an Acro. And you launched, they, they physically launched it within the bridge. It didn't actually touch or load the bridge until it hit the arches. And for about the end, the spans over water, they put the steel truss within the, the covered bridge. On top of it, put these transverse members that supported it. And that's what they used with, then they would jack that and support the bridge. Over land, they were able to put some, some temporary uh, pieces. So from that point, now you've got the bridge supported, and then it's really just craftsmanship and a lot of hard, a lot of hard work. The guys on these bridges work really hard. Um, a, a good or bad thing, depending on how you think of it, is uh, they were able to work through the winter on this project. And uh, winter in Bath is really cold. Yes. Uh, they were like, yeah, like minus 20 cold. Mm -hmm. And they, they work through it. But um, so it, you know, keeps contractors busy and working. But it's a lot of a lot of handwork at that point. You take the member out, use it as a template, put put a new pieces, a uh, new piece back. And um, mm -hmm. like I said, it's it, it that's really as far as the bid side of it, you know, the business side, that's where contractors will win or lose it if they come up with a really interesting in the past, I think when Arnold did some of the work back in the eighties, uh, it had actually iced up under there, and I, I believe he used some, you know, some worked off the ice on that a little bit. Oh wow! Which that's tricky because the ice level comes up and down, but right, um, right. I probably wouldn't do that today. No, and that was a twenty-one month project. Is that how long that was? Yeah. Yeah, that's it's, a it's, long time. It's a long time. Yeah, and. Part of it is those things we talked about. You you gotta you gotta order the material, get the shoring in. Uh, it's three hundred seventy five feet long, and right. people are like, well, just have more people work on it. Well, there's you want people that have you know have the skills, and none of the none of the firms I talked about are very big, mm -hmm. so they they kind of can only go so fast. And um, the the townspeople were really pretty good about it. Like I said, that that long detour. Mm -hmm. um, Certainly inconvenient, but the plan is not to have to do that again for, for a while. Were there any unique or interesting things that you learned during this project? Yeah, it was, um, there's a lot of history to that bridge. And I think you, you brought up some good, good stories. I think there's a lot of them. There was a, a woman on the West side who, who had this story. I, I, you know, I'm, you know, it was 15 years ago. I'm trying to remember the details, but basically she said at one point they were working on the deck or something. So they, they strung up some kind of like basket through the bridge that, to get her from one side to the other because she had to go across the bridge to get to school. And they kind of like put her in this basket and pull her across. That's funny. Which sounds like a crazy uh, thing. You mentioned the horses. That was really neat. Um, and at one point, one of the uh, people up there told me they used to put mailboxes in the bridge because the, the, the the post office wouldn't go across the bridge, so all the mailboxes for the people on the, the west side were within the bridge. That's funny. And That's uh, funny. in Bassney, too, I know you you had some really good information, but they have their town reports go back quite a ways, and we, we looked at those. And uh, one thing we haven't talked about was they used to pay people to snow the bridge. Mm -hmm. So they would actually put... Yeah, they would they would put snow within the bridge so that sleighs could go through it. Mm -hmm. And I imagine a bridge that long that's a that's a big job. It's a it's a big job, yeah. So they had, uh, you know, they had different payments to snow the bridge and the. If you, it's it's interesting looking at those old town reports. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. Oftentimes, I'll ask people when I'm presenting about. Why do you think covered bridges are are covered? And a lot of people will say to keep the snow off, and then someone will say, "But they put snow in it." So, so it's an interesting conversation. 
You know, yeah, exactly. we're, we're so far away from using sleighs that, you know, you, you wouldn't think that you would put snow on a bridge unless you gave it some thought. So. Yeah. One other interesting thing up there was, uh, so that's the Amanusik river nearby is the wild Amanusik and, but the Amanusik is pretty wild too. In the winter, uh, it ices up and we've got some video of just when an ice flow broke loose and it's these big chunks, you know, like a four foot square of ice coming through. And those piers, those piers were built in like 1830, really with no modifications have survived the whole time. Um, and the, in it's, it's interesting. So the 1830, the stone piers, no problem. They're, they're doing fine. They put the timber bents in, I mentioned on the West side. Well, one year this ice came through and just took three of them right out, just like wow. completely destroyed them. So that was, you know, we, we worked on this project for a number of years, but there were some interim steps where we, I mentioned fixing the pier. Another, and that broke some of, not only that, but it broke some of the lower cords. So we had to do some repairs there. I bet. So uh, really, really impressive up there when the ice comes through. Uh, covered Bridge historian Joseph Conwell um, said about the Bath Bridge, he said it's the last remnants of an old regional building tra tradition and also said Bath Bridge represents the early idiosyncratic craftsman tradition of wooden truss bridge building before designs became more standardized under the influence of the major patented truss plans. It is very difficult to classify. Can you talk about that? Yeah, jo he, uh, Joseph said it way better than I. Um, <laughs> but he's he's right. This this is, you know, there's this is a unique um unique truss system. It's really well built. It's a combination of, uh, and when it was a three span bridges, those are really long spans. Mm -hmm. uh, it's long, it's a wide bridge. And what happened later was, you know, Ithiel Town, you know, Stephen Howe, uh, others started patenting different trusses. And it was kind of this, this race to see who could do them. All of them other than how really didn't have any basis in, in, in engineering at all. And house was the only one that was really, um, you know, had some, some mathematics behind it per se, but this was just a, I, I really wish it would be amazing to see how they built this 375 foot long bridge 200 years ago. It's, it's mm -hmm. really awesome. Mm -hmm. It is. And I, I, I searched to find out who built it and I couldn't, I couldn't find any records on that. No, I think there were records of of who built the piers, mm -hmm. which was strange. They, uh, I think those records are around, but no, you're right on the trust. This project received recognition. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we, we were really fortunate to win uh, a couple on this. So uh, American Council of Engineering Companies in New Hampshire, uh, we got an honorable mention Engineering Excellence Award. So that's nice to be recognized by your peers. Mm -hmm. And then another one, which is a national award, uh, it's kind of long, but American Public Works Association. So it's really all the, you know, the, the town level, city level public works. They have a uh, project of the year for historic restoration. And we, we won that for this project as well. Oh, that's great. So it's, it's nice to get some national recognition. And um, I should say too, in Bath, these, these projects take a lot of time and there was, uh, you know, several people, uh, you know, Alan Rutherford was a selectman there for a number of years, Pam Murphy at the town hall, um, uh, and, and others as well. I'm I apologize. Anyone listening, I forget your names, but they, Bath was really fortunate. It had a, a number of people that were continuous in the government and kept these things moving and, and really worked on not only this bridge, but the Swift Water Bridge, which is in, in town. Uh, we did previously to this. And then Haverhill Bath, uh, which that's always interesting to me, too. So if you go back in time, you look, it was always the bath Haverhill Bridge. And then more recently, the town that kind of led the funding, which is Haverhill, mm -hmm. it becomes the Haverhill Bath. So it's, it was kind of interesting how those switches happen. Yeah, it definitely depends who you're talking to. and how. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, most of it is in in Haverhill, though, so mm -hmm. it, it, it kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, 
I thank you for working on the Bath Bridge and saving it. It is one of the one of the most beautiful bridges. I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but it is in my top list. Um, and uh, I appreciate you sharing this project with with us. And uh, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Very, thank you. Covered Bridges of New Hampshire is created by me and recorded in Hancock, New Hampshire. The song Old New Hampshire was arranged and performed by Josh Black. The introduction is courtesy of Greg Kretschmar. This podcast is a companion to my book, Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. You can find out more about the book, the podcast, blog posts, upcoming events, and an interactive covered bridge map at coveredbridgesnh.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. Please rate, review, and subscribe to or follow the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Kim Chandler. Thanks for listening. Thank you.